My name is Will Actually, and yeah, of course I have a podcast. I am broadcasting all the way from my mother's basement to bring you all the King's Voices, a podcast where we talk to drag kings and things about drag performance, identity, and everything in between. Now, if you are watching the podcast, you can listen on anchor.fm slash King's Voices pod, or if you're listening, you can actually watch us on YouTube. Just search for King's Voices pod. Today's guest probably needs no introduction, but I'm going to give you one anyway, or at least do my best. Moby Dick is cited as one of the founding fathers of the modern-day drag king movement, and he pioneered many firsts, including in 1996 when he created Club Casanova in New York City, the world's first weekly drag king party. And in 1998, he took Club Casanova on the road for the first-ever drag king tour of the U.S. and Canada. Since then, he's been featured across different media, including the Drag King book, uh, Pecker, a film by John Waters, as well as several other documentaries, television shows, and films. Um, Since moving to the West Coast, Mo has served as a frequent guest judge for the annual San Francisco Drag King Contest, a contest that is near and dear to my heart. In 2018, Mo teamed up with fellow drag king Ken Vegas of Washington, D.C. to create the website DragKingHistory.com, which we've talked about on this podcast before. Currently, Mo also produces and hosts Kings of the World, a global cyber drag king variety show on twitch.tv slash kings of the world. And their next show is May 20th, so make sure that you tune in. And of course, you can check out www.mrmobydick.com for Mo info. All right, let's go meet Mo. Hey folks, how are you? My name is Moby Dick, and that's spelled M-O-B period D-I-C-K. I'm originally from New York City, and uh, currently here in 2020, I live in Los Angeles. Hi, Mo. How you doing? <laughs> oh, I'm terrific. I'm terrific. Despite yeah. the coronavirus and the quarantine, I'm doing great. Yeah. Well, it seems like you're thriving. I've seen the Kings of the World show happening. That's so cool that you brought Drag Kings online. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, a labor of love, you know, and um, and I love doing it, yeah. you know, so because it's been wonderful. And, and how that I little give you a little backstory. So everybody knows the history of that. So uh, Cake Boys had asked me Cake Boys from the collective from New York City mm-hmm. had um, asked me to host the show. And I said, great. And because of the coronavirus, they backed out because New York City is just inundated and it was just the too much for them. Yeah. And they were under emotional duress. So uh, I uh, teamed up with, and they were collaborating with Johnny Gentleman and Pelvis Bresley of here who live in Los Angeles area. And so I teamed up with them and, I, and they said, oh, we don't know. You know what? I said, I'll, I got this. I got this. So I... Use, you know, my contacts and connections, you know, and uh, research from around the world. And I said, well, this is Kings of the World. So we're going to get Kings of the World involved here. So, you know, that's the focus of the show. And uh, there's the other show that Pelvis and Johnny that they produce. It's called Spit Easy. And that's the first Wednesday of the month. And Kings of the World is the third Wednesday of the month. And so Spit Easy is more for the hometown heroes you know, the fellas, the, the drag kings and queens and in-betweens who don't get the recognition, you know, that they deserve or warrant. And, you know, so they want the same kind of exposure. And uh, Kings of the World is more of a broader, you know, really reaching out to the world and, you know, seeing that that we are connected, we're all a collective community. Yeah, and it's so awesome because the some of the performances are just like, Mind blowing. And it's like, I'm sitting here in Madison, Wisconsin going, well, I wish I could be in Spain now. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Like everybody is so good. Um, but yeah, so, so that's the, and sorry, excuse me to interrupt. So that was yeah. my idea. So I, when I was casting for it, I said, oh boy, how do I, 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 I can't just pick one person. Like, this is too hard. You know what I mean? Like, how do I make this work? And, you know, so I said, all right. So I came up with the idea that everybody's in quarantine. So each person, so each collective, Mm -hmm. you pick one song, everybody lip sync to that same song, and then you edit it together. And then you create this story. 
oh my god, these these and they were everything was pre-recorded because I was like, I don't want to monkey around with the live with the time change yeah. and the technical di difficulties, you know, because we were putting it together. I mean, three weeks in three weeks we put that show together. Wow! And the first one that aired on uh, that was live April twenty second. Yep. And then uh, the um, what was I going to say the. Uh, uh, yeah, so the vid these pre-recorded videos were astounding. They blew me out of the water. I, I mean, it was beyond, beyond what I envisioned. Oh yeah, it was so much fun to watch. I was finishing my one of my final papers for my queer theory class and kind of just like, well, I could fin I could finish this later, uh, <laughs> you know. And I still finished on time. So <laughs> to the technical, the, you know, the newness. We didn't record it because there was a little button embedded and it went, <laughs> oh, you know, yeah. so that would, be but we still have those videos and I'm going to be posting them. We're going to start a, a Kings of the world page on Facebook. Oh, awesome. And, and, you know, so we're going to post those videos. So, because the, oh, just wonderful, wonderful work. Oh, that's so cool. Well, yeah. so I definitely encourage everybody to go check that out and I'll have a link, uh, in the YouTube and you know, all the podcast notes and the whole thing about where to find that. But, um, so you've been involved in a lot of projects. So, uh, yeah. so that's 2020, but let's go back to what is it? 1998? <laughs> well, no, 1995, 95. November 1995, I started out as a drag King and, uh, how that came about. I spent the summer in 1995 in Provincetown, Massachusetts. And that's where I first met drag Kings. I met Julie Wheeler, I met uh, Busta Hyman mm -hmm. and those two, I, I said, wow, this is mind blowing. They, they were terrific performers, absolutely terrific performers. And they said, oh, you should try it. And I said, well, nah, I don't know. I'm too girly. That's not, I don't know. You know, and I, I had this limited idea of what a drag king or what, what a person had to be in order to be a drag king. Yeah. And um, long story, make it short. I traveled to uh, San Francisco and a friend of mine saved this article. And the article was from the San Francisco Weekly, and it's and it was talking about the San Francisco scene, mm -hmm. and there was a, a woman who had this major transformation, and I said, "Whoa, I had limited thinking. Like, look at this tra transformation. Anybody can do this. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be a specific type of person." So I came back to New York City, and I got my hair cut, and I saved those clippings. And then I went to a thrift store and I said, well, I got to get guys clothing. And I'm looking around, looking around. And I found a shirt that said Dick on it. And I said, holy shit, that's it. Moby Dick, done. And, and not M-O-B-Y. Because right. I knew that would be a copyright infringement. Yep. And so then I went over, you know, I had that on. And I said, called up my friend, Mistress Formica, drag queen, a friend of mine that I met in Provincetown. And I said, I want to get in drag. And, you know, he said, you're, you're crazy. Why? Yeah. I only glue and I said great let's do it so, <laughs> got, you know went over to his house did it got you know uh put some facial hair on I put a ski cap on had baggy jeans the shirt that said dick on it had some a uh, pair of socks in my panties and I'm walking down the street and these group of guys on the corner that normally as a woman mm -hmm. I would have been harassed I would have been verbally harassed and and I said oh shit oh shit oh shit what do I do I walked by they said hey uh, I said, Hey, and then, you know, I turned the corner. I said, Oh shit, I passed. I can't believe it. Oh my God. This is great. You know, first time in my life I felt, you know, safe walking around in New York city. Yeah. I said, oh man, there's something to this drag. And, uh, then I went out to, uh, meow mix and, um, nobody recognized me. And in fact, Julie Wheeler was there and we're on the dance floor and, you know, we're trying to get, you know, do the, I was like, all right, how do men dance? You know, that was a, last and then from that I created Club Casanova mm -hmm. and um, so I started meeting other drag kings in New York City and Club Casanova started it was the very first weekly drag king show like the world's first and that started in 96 and went on for almost two years and uh, it was uh, a lot of work a lot of fun and we got a lot of notoriety from that yeah which is so cool. So can you describe like what the, the vibe of Club Casanova, what, what was it like? Uh, you know, somebody said to me, 
this guy, there was an old makeup company called Tony and Tina. Uh-huh. And they came in and the, the best compliment I ever got. And he said, oh, my God, this is like the Sex Pistols. <laughs> and, you know, he was British, yeah. obviously. And I said, whoa, that is a compliment. It's like, it doesn't get better than that. Yeah. You know? um, and, and it was because it was iconic. And, you know, and it was uh, it was mind blowing. You walked in and there was a drag king collecting money for the show. You looked around, there was Drag King's go-go dancing. You looked over, there was a Drag King DJ, and then Drag King's milling about. Yeah. And then you see this Drag King show. And it was just, it was fun. It was a lot, a lot of fun. Yeah. Oh, that's... I'm just, I am sad that I not, like, don't have the opportunity to go see that. You know, I know there's a Drag King renaissance, and you can go see kings all over the world, but... It well, feels like. everybody online now. That's yeah. what that's what's so great about this coronavirus <laughs> is now we're all connecting online. Very true. And like never before. Like that that couldn't have happened in my time because I mean you had what you know fifty sixty people crammed into a room you know in a bar you know what I mean yeah. and I mean now it's like we had seven hundred people you know logging in. Oh you wow! Know. Yeah, and it was like almost three hundred were active users. And then, you know, they said, you know, when I got, the, you get the report afterwards, the statistics. I said, holy shit. Yeah. 700 people logged in, you know. That's cool. incredible. <laughs> That's, yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. So, so when you first discovered Drag Kings, like what, what made you want to become one? Like what made you go, that's a thing, like, you know, uh, because I feel like, especially when you're thinking about the beginning of kind of the modern drag king history, right? There's not really like a reference for it. Um, like, yes, there's queens and, you know, like people today can go on Instagram and be like, I like this kind of makeup. I want to try this. But like, what was it for you that made you go? Yeah, this is the thing. Well, firstly, I got a question. What do you mean there's not a reference? Well, I mean, so we didn't have DragKingHistory.com, um, which everyone should go check out. Um, but you know what I mean? Like there wasn't, there there are male impersonators there, but there wasn't a yep. Drag King yep. community. You know what Got I mean? It. Yep, yep, yep. There was, um, it, so there, you know, there were isolated individuals mm-hmm. that were performing as Drag Kings. Yeah. And, and so we'll get to Drag King history, you know, in, in a minute. But, you know, um, because I have some theories ar- around it and, you know, some ideas, you know. So um, anyhow, uh, you're right. There wasn't a whole community, you know, uh, and it, why it happened in the mid 90s, you know, with, with this burgeoning drag king communities that were happening all over the world. Yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> you know, but um, uh, but it happened. You know, and it was just time. Uh, so, uh, so what prompted me to do it? You know, so it was like I said. I mean, I saw Julie Wheeler and Buster Hyman in Provincetown, and I was blown away by their performances. And as a child, I used to dress up, you know, in different characters. I loved to play dress up. I just loved it. And one of my if Halloween to me, I if it could be every day, I would love it. You know what I mean? I just love and. Uncle Fester was one of my favorite characters, you know, so (laughs) I just loved, you know, doing whatever expression, whether it was female or male, you know, so I just loved doing that. I loved playing dress up. Yeah. And so after I read that article in San Francisco, then I said, oh, I could do this too. So that really was what prompted me. And because I could, you know, it was the same thing as a child that, that, that joy and the pleasure of dressing up, creating a character. Yeah. I created a whole character. It wasn't that I just dressed up. Yeah. You know, I created a, a full formed character and the character didn't, I didn't hone in on it until I uh, was asked to perform at this, uh, gay and lesbian experimental film festival called mix. Okay. And so the mixed festival, so because when I was starting out, I was adopting, you know, I was, I played a drunken sailor. I played an, you know, an East Village rocker guy. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I, you know, I was like a Las Vegas guy. You know, I was, I was like trying on different personas. And it wasn't until the Gay and Lesbian Film Festival that I honed in on Moby Dick. So, and what I did, I created this monologue 
this schmuck of a guy, <laughs> you know, who was talking about tits and ass and pussy and going to the strip shows and, you know, this and that and hanging out with the girlies and, and, um, and I was feigning sickness. And so, and then I was turning into a fly, a human fly. And so I lip synced to the song by the cramps, human yes. fly, which happens to be one of my favorite bands. And, you know, so the subtext of that, like flies have been around and pests have been around for centuries, as long as like earth started. Yep. And so it's like, you know, my motto then came out of that. Instead of being an angry woman, I became a funny man. And so that was the birth of my character. And that's how I honed in on it. Because all of those men that, you know, harass you in yeah. the street and all, you know, that ERA hasn't been ratified in all 50 states. And, you know, that was kiboshed in the 70s, you know, and so all these things, this inequities for women that I get so mad about yeah. that I could put it in my character and be this dick of a guy and everybody loved it. And they laughed their asses off. I'm like, oh, all right. I don't know if New Yorker is a bunch of sadists, there's, you know, and masochists. I don't know. Or you know what I mean? Like, I don't know about that. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, it was, an, it was a form of expression that uh, allowed me to uh, express my anger in a comedic way. Whereas women, they're like, uh, you're a bitch. Right. Uh, you're shrill. You're too angry. Yeah. Like, you know, as a child, I was told, you're too aggressive. And I said, so? The, isn't that called ambition? Yeah. You know? And, you know, but as a child, I didn't have that understanding, but I, I, I had confusion. I, I thought, well, what's the matter with that? You know what I mean? Right. And, I, and I would watch my brothers. I have six brothers. And, you know, I watched them. I said, do you tell them they're aggressive? I don't think so. You mm -hmm. know, so there's inequities just. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. It. It is. It's interesting. So my character will actually kind of he was born from uh, I was doing a one woman show and I it was a burlesque show. So I needed some way to cover the transitions. And so uh, my best friend suggested, well, why don't you just video yourself mansplaining in between the acts? And it that was. Yeah, like literally that when I put on Will and I had the chance to just sit there and like say all the toxic shit that like. I knew could be said about what I was doing, right? Because I was doing a feminist show about, you know, just why it sometimes sucks being an AFAB person in the world, right? Um, and it just, it was so cathartic. Yeah. You know? And it was just like, man, I got to do more of this. And yeah. it's, it's weird. And I, I think from what I'm hearing from what you're saying is like, you know, when I go out into the world as Will, people tell me, you know, I hate him so much, but I really can't help loving him. And I don't know why I get the same thing. Yeah. And it's same like, yeah. now, and you know, you're doing something right as an artist. If people say, you know, I go oh, so many times. Oh God, you remind me of my <laughs> uncle. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, you remind me of oh, my ex-boyfriend. Oh, you remind me of that mm -hmm. visceral reaction. Yep. I knew I was doing a good job. Yep. Yeah. And that's, the gays were all going, oh, I just want to fuck you. you know, <laughs> yes. They were like these drag kings. I'm getting sexually frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I have, I have had more, more than a few confused boners in my audiences. And it's fun. <laughs> you know, but that's, I, I feel like there's something very powerful in that, in the sense of like, just being able to, to subvert what people expect of you and also subvert their own desires in, in a lot of ways, right? Like what they expect and desire you to be, right? Like that's yep. why I love performing as a king because it's just, yeah, you don't get to pick for me. I'm going to let you know how to feel. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. So I, I want to um, piggyback on that. I, I'm sure you have questions, but yeah, because um, you know, this, I want to parlay into Drag King History. Yeah, please. DragKingHistory.com started um in january of 2018 i was taking a hot bath and I, I, actually actually what happened prompted this was uh i you know was reading all the articles on drag kings and you know they were coming out from all over the world mm -hmm. and you know the, on facebook reading people's comments in the facebook groups and they said oh i'm the only drag king around there's no other drag kings you know, I'm, you know, the only one ever, you know, and, <laughs> and, and you know, and it, I thought, wait a minute, you know, that, that bothered me. 
yeah, that sure. I said, legacy. I've got a, you know, I've, I've done a lot. Yeah. And so, and then I said, you know what? You're right. I don't have online presence. So shame on me. So, because, you know, you can point a finger, but you got three pointing back at you. So I had to look at myself and I said, wow, you kids are right. So I created my website and then I said, well, I want to do more because it was not just me. It was never just the Moby Dick show. Right. Like I knew drag kings, you know, they were all over the country, you know, because like when some of these kings start out a collective now, oh, we're the first collective. I said, no, you weren't. Mm -mm. No, you weren't. Yeah. And so they don't have online, you know, like I know because I perform there. Right. You know, so, um, you know, so that's when I said, uh, oh, you know, I should do a book. And I, I contacted, uh, Fudgy Frotage and Fudgy said, Mo, nobody reads. They don't read books. <laughs> and I said, you're right. So <laughs> not wrong. Fudgy. Fudgy. <laughs> website. So I said, great. So then the next person, and it was just all kismet. So the next person I, I contacted was, uh, Ken Vegas of Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. And I said, Ken, you know, I, so I thought I wanted to do a book. Now I'm thinking a website, you know, and Ken said, Oh my God, you know, I have the don't, I'm a web developer and I've had the uh, domain name draggingHistory.com for 10 years. And I didn't know what I wanted to do with it. And so bam, we yeah. collaborated and put it together. And then uh, flair was a part of it for mm -hmm. a while, helping consult and you know helping the formation of it and you know so parlaying that into what we were talking about so i do the research and these women it's the same theme that they drag gives them gave them permission the same theme over history over the centuries mm -hmm. so women have to be shy and docile and quiet in and stay home yeah. do not go to the public arena so now when women were in theater, whether it be in plays starting in 1660 with the, uh, you know, the restoration mm -hmm. comedies and, you know, you had Afro Ben, who was the first female playwright, you know, out of England. But there was uh, there was another one, but the first one at that time. Yeah. Was, but we go back and dragging history dot com back to the Tang Dynasty in China. So the Chinese opera incorporated, you know, male impersonation a part of like the original uh, Romeo and Juliet, you know, so was, it came out of the sixth century, you know, or yeah. seventh AD, you know what I mean? I mean, like, it's like mind blowing. So that it was the same theme that these women, as these playing these characters, the male impersonation, they could be angry, they could be bawdy, mm -hmm. they could do all the forms of expression that they were forbidden to them. And they could be in public. Yep. They perform in front of men, women, children, which they were not allowed to do. And so that was is what is so extraordinary about Drag King history. So when you look through the centuries and all these women, I feel like these women are whispering in my ears, you know, tell my story, tell yeah. my story. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's so like an honor and privilege to do this website. Yeah. And it's such, it's a good resource because for so many people who are discovering, you know, the art of being a drag king online now is just like, oh, it's an Instagram thing to do or, you know, like it's just another cosplay or, you know, there, there's so many different ways to find the art, but it really helps to have the history. Yeah. Because it change now, it changes something. I, I agree because it gives us more depth. Yeah, you know. Because, and now I'm struggling trying to find how do we document the modern day drag kings. You know what I mean? Like starting from yeah. you know the the 1980s through to today. I don't know how to you know find the formula for that. I created something on YouTube, but it didn't quite catch. You know, you know, the five W's like, who are you? When did you start? Where are you located? And answer a what and a, you know, a what and a why. Yeah. But it, it hasn't caught on. It's not quite it. So I'm still, you know, searching. How do we document? So then the, you know, the modern day uh, drag king, and I say modern day. So it's like, after, you know, from the new millennium on, you know, because the last millennium, that was like the that's part of the modern day. But, or I should say, like modern day and current, yeah. you, know, you know, delineating the two. But the modern day, you know, starting from, uh, you know, the 80s and 90s, you know, how do we document 
because so much happened then. And how do we document that? So, you know, the current kings aren't saying, oh, I'm the only one, I'm the only first collective, you know, so I don't know the answer. If anybody has the answer, let me know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hey, that's why I'm working on the podcast is get all the stories, you know, and maybe some way I'll figure out how to transcribe them and send them on your way, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but yeah. Well, I, yeah. No, but there's more for the current kings, you know, to know who they who the, were the kings from the uh, 80s and 90s. Yeah. Because we didn't have the internet. Yeah. And so the modern, the current kings, you've got the Instagram, you got the mm -hmm. Facebook, you got the YouTube, right? You know, so you've got all these tools where you can connect with each other and can learn about each other, yeah, and learn how to do it, yeah. And it, so I, I'm curious too because there, there are, I would say you're, you're very right in that there are kind of two distinct modern king yeah. experiences, right? Um, there's, you know, it's the like internet post internet yeah and and i feel like there's like the the from the like early 90s through like the idke era right is like a thing and then there's like quiet and then instagram and then we're all here now <laughs> you know um so I, i'm curious kind of what you see as like what makes a drag king? What's different between male impersonation and breaches roles and all of that? And like, what's different from when you first started to now? I know that's a really simple question. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, facetious there. Very. Okay, so firstly, I will, I will answer. So the delineation between drag king, male impersonation and breaches role. Yeah. You know, so breaches roles and, and travesty that's that started in, you know, opera. And so that was sometimes, you know, either as a, a plot twist mm -hmm. or, you know, a disguise, you know, where the audience knows, you yeah. know, you're in disguise, you know, Shakespeare in love. Right. You know, um, and, you know, they're in on the secret, you know, and whatnot. Um, and that's and it's used till, you know, it's used today. Yeah. You know, so, uh, sometimes they call it trouser rolls, you know, as well. So then male impersonation. So this is a, a really important thing to distinguish. Stormé de Larvier mm -hmm. identified as a male impersonator, not a drag king. Right. And told me that. I knew Stormé. Oh, and personally, okay. Stormé said to me, you know, it was, it was almost um, uh, foretelling. And Stormé said, Mo, you know, this really baritone voice. Make sure nobody ever calls me a drag king. And I never understood that, you know. And then I, you know, and then I read Esther Newton's book, Mother Camp. Mm -hmm. And Esther talks about that's an anthropological study of drag queens in the late 60s, early 70s. And in that, it, there's a whole vocabulary and there's a whole hierarchy for, you know, the, the queen. So when you're a female impersonator, that was highly revered. Right. And a drag queen, not not lesser you're revered but it's you're not everybody wanted to be the female impersonator Got you know it. what i mean yeah and then or a street fairy and you know so there was like all these different you know so so when you talk about so two things there so when you talk about you know the uh history for drag kings there's a dearth of that the, the, there was not it was not synonymous in the lesbian community right so because if you uh, read a lot of Lillian uh, Faderman. Mm -hmm. You know, she talks a lot, her history, like everybody, everybody should have all Lillian Faderman's books. I had the privilege of um, uh, interviewing her. And I mean, wonderful, wonderful person. Anyhow, so you look at that at the time, uh, you know, in the 1920s, you had the balls and, you know, this and that. And so that's where the gay and lesbian community started to form. Yeah. And then from that, then bars developed so the queens took it on and they kept going with it, mm. right? The gay men kept up with that. And they were emulating, if you read George Chauncey's book, Gay New York, they were emulating the debutante balls. Okay. You know, and, you know, the coming out. That's the expression came from the debutante balls. And then the whole she, mm -hmm. that came from gay men working together in an office and not wanting to out themselves. So they would say, oh, yeah, she, I went out with her, mm -hmm. but they were talking about men. So that was, they were using that as code. Got it. So, and lesbians never did that. Lesbians never said he, you know, because it was more in some ways that historically lesbians are like, 
Well, they don't have sex. There's no dick. Right. There's no penis involved. So there's what what sex can you have? Right. You know, so so two women could live together and people wouldn't question it. Mm. Started questioning if the the uh, person was butch and wore men's clothing, and then you know that they could get arrested. But there was this is where I struggle with how to identify because you've got out of the 30s and 40s. Um, there were a lot of lesbian performers who wore tuxedos. Mm -hmm. They weren't male impersonators and they weren't in drag because that's what was comfortable for them to wear. Right. Right. Yeah. So I interviewed Robin Tyler. Robin Tyler came out of the 1960s in New York City. And so Robin was a female, female impersonator. She would impersonate Judy Garland. Okay. So then she started performing in a tuxedo, she felt more comfortable. That wasn't drag for her. Right. Being in a dress was drag. So there's this whole group of performers that wore tuxedos because we've got in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s that I go, oh, you know, this, if we're dragging history, you know, how do I identify these performers? I don't know yet. So mm -hmm. I'm you know, still mulling it over. And again, if anybody has suggestions, I'm open to it. So, um, but then when you, uh, back to Stormé de Larvier, mm -hmm. Stormé was a part of the Jewel Box Review, which was mind blowing that it started in the fifties and sixties at a time where high homophobia, high racism, mm -hmm. and it was an uh, intercultural uh, mixed completely gay show that traveled the country and nobody bad an eye that they were not arrested. It was unbelievable. Yeah. And Stormate was the, uh, I, my understanding is there was not, Stormate wasn't the only male impersonator, but was the main one. Mm -hmm. And Stormate said to me, Mo, I'm a male impersonator as a drag king. It was a lesser quality, uh, moniker. Okay. So that's that's to distinguish it. Now to distinguish drag king, mm -hmm. there's a comedic uh, camp element that yeah. I don't. Uh, the new the current kings understand camp, mm -hmm. and to the as extent of what it really is, you yeah. know, that it's the exaggerated expression of masculinity. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I. I... I think that's a really good distinction. And I think it's also important to know that camp has a place, not just in the drag queen lexicon, but in the drag king lexicon. You yep. know, um, one of the things, so when I started, I started in burlesque. And so, because I never felt comfortable performing as a woman, right? So, so for me, being sexy was always like, sexy. So I exaggerated it and doing it as as a man, right? Doing it as a king gave me a way in to play up the camp of like, what is this sexy? Like, uh -huh. this is just goofy, you know? And getting the audience in on the joke. And and so I, I think that that part of the performance aspect often gets lost when you're just looking at an Instagram photo, for example, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's, um, it's it's really interesting. I, I've, I've talked to, to a bunch of different kings who kind of come at this art form from, you know, having started it, uh, you know, in the in the post Instagram era, right? Who come at it from different angles, where it is about the makeup and the art, right? Or it is about incorporating a different art form into drag, but doing it masculinely because it offers some sort of freedom that doing it as a woman or femininely didn't offer. Right. And it's so it's it's interesting to think about it when you think about it in context. Like, so where is the camp? Where is the humor? And how are you using that in your art? Or are you right? So I don't know. I don't It's not really a question. It's more of an observation, <laughs> I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. But um, but that's I, I appreciate that distinction from a contextual standpoint. Um, I think it's important, though, because I, I hear a lot of current kings say, oh, well, it's an expression of me. Yeah, but then there's also, you know, you got to give it more depth, you know, than that. You know, that, I mean, of course, it's an expression of you. You're doing it. Yeah. You know, 
you know, from a, a theatrical standpoint, I don't know that everybody, like you understand the theatrical standpoint. I don't know that, that um, current drag kings, you know, understand the theatrical nature of what you're doing. And the camp, like camp is not bantered around in the drag king community. And yeah. it's like, well, you're a camp, you right. know what I'm you know, so. Yeah, well, so. And, and I see also a lot of kings don't, uh, have a full body character, you know, mm -hmm. that I always hear the female voice. Yeah. Where, no, oh, you just kind of took me out of it. You know what I mean? Like I adopted a full body character. I use a different voice, you know, because I have this full body character. So everybody knows that it's like, I would get people who would give me gifts. They said, oh my God, here's a great shirt. I know Moby Dick will love this. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, and here's got you. I got Moby Dick, uh, you know, some cufflinks. So I got Moby, you know, I'm like, they knew who I am as a character, uh, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So that you can exist even off stage in character and people recognize you. Yeah. No, that's, it's, um, people wouldn't always recognize me though. I get people, some people would say, I recognize you from your eyes or your smile. <laughs> I look very different out of drag. Yeah. Very different. Well, it's a transformation. I mean, but that's part of the magic. I, you know, yeah. um, and it's interesting. So, uh, so I am in school and I'm reading all these articles about drag kings and one of the biggest holes in the literature. And one of the reasons why I'm doing this and hoping to contribute to, uh, a literature on what makes a king is because all of the articles on drag kings that I have read have either said one masculinity is boring and you can't perform it or two drag kings are about being trans or about being non-binary or being it's all about gender identity and it's not about uh performance and so it's like it blows my mind when i when i don't when i can't find like you know i mean obviously there are there are other examples of of, of a few articles that i have found that's about the performative part but to me what's lacking in academia at the very least is that drag kings aren't seen as separate from the person who puts on the makeup, which for some people it's not, but for some people it is, you know, like, and I feel like it's important to acknowledge that being a king is, it's not, it's, you're not just, um, putting on somebody else's clothes, right. Um, or putting on the clothes that you wish you could wear in real life or that you do wear in real life. You know, I, I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah, and I'm, I got to tell you, you know, I have seen some, you know, baby kings who come out and I'm like, well, oh, you just look like a lesbian who put on a mustache. <laughs> it, you know what I mean? So I can see the merit in some of those, you know, articles yep. because, you know, there was not the same elaborate transformation. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're using your own hair, you know, do it up in a style, you know, that, uh, you know, or something, do something different to it. Now we've got the advent of wigs. Mm -hmm. you know, and makeup, like get a little more elaborate with the makeup and costume, wear a costume. I don't want to see the same jeans that you wore yesterday to go to Trader Joe's. You right. know what I mean? Like just that's boring. Yeah. And, you know, so where's the, it's show business. You know, there's show that means you got to show it. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, so we were discussing um, before we started officially recording just this idea that masculinity is boring. And one of the things that I think is important to talk about is building a character. Right. So I would like to throw it to like, you. I, 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 it, it makes me so irate, irate when I, I've heard that. I've seen it written. And it's like, oh, you know, come on. Yeah. Like, it just, it's so, it, it's again, putting women in the box. Like it, I think it's more, it's, uh, people see it's funny for a man to put on a dress and it's threatening for a woman to put on a suit. And so that's what makes me irate. And that's like the overall, you know, arc of what we're talking about. Yeah. And this, you know, ironically that, um, you know, gay men, you know, and, and drag queens, you know, have this, uh, full carte blanche, they can, you know, perform and be out there. And then it's like women like, 
no, why, why are you doing that? Like, you know, you know, it's not that it's not performative and not interesting and not fun yeah. and it's not entertaining. You know, it's frightening for people because women are empowering themselves, usurping, you know, this male privilege that right. the men are like, uh, uh-uh. uh, right. having said that though, I got to say something that does another thing that bothers me yeah. is you know, that so many drag kings say, oh, you know, these drag queens and, you know, this and that and RuPaul drag race and blah, blah, blah. Look, RuPaul's RuPaul. RuPaul's not God. RuPaul, you know, has got a team of people and, and RuPaul's worked since the 1980s and worked his fucking ass off to be where he is today. Do I like that he excludes drag kings? No, I don't like that. And I think it's wrong and egregious yeah yet so what am i going to do am i going to stand there and complain about rupaul no what am i going to do i'm going to watch the show and i'm going to educate myself and say what are they doing that's successful what can i do that's successful you yeah. know how can i improve what yeah. can i do you know so i created drag king history i got kings of the world show i'm not sitting around complaining and you know what i do also mm -hmm. i look around and i say Hey, what's today? Is there a drag king show going on today? And so, so I, I put it on and I watch it. Yeah. And so all these drag kings that are complaining, I'm not getting my stage. I'm not getting my due and oh, RuPaul this and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. What are you doing to support the drag kings? Are you showing up at the shows? There are thousands of people, mm -hmm. thousands of performers that are part of the Facebook groups. Yep. Why aren't thousands watching the shows? Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. You know, so you want to be supported, go out and support the other drag kings too. And that's how you create their community. Knock it off with the complaining, like knock it off, <laughs> you know, do something yeah. about, because the complaining just makes you a complainer, right. you know, be proactive. Look, I don't like the shit that goes on. Like I said, instead of being an angry woman, I became a funny man. I get out there and I do it. Yeah. Well, and that's, I mean, I think that is where, Drag kings in a, in a lot of ways do have to work harder because to educate people about what, what we are, right? Well, because the, you know what, we're women yeah. trying to take up space and we're not permitted because we're women. Right. And the male privilege, that's what it boils down to. Right. And people look at, like you said, look at a woman in a suit as threatening. So how do you translate that to be something that's funny, that is relatable, that is, you know, what we talked about earlier, right? Is that recognizable uh, character that people want to see, right? So um, it, and it's so, one of the reasons why I love Drag King so much is because when you do that successfully, it's so fucking good, you know, and it's so much harder than just, you know, picking up a script and, you know, putting on a pair of pants or just painting your face. There's so much that goes into being a compelling king, in my, in my humble opinion, <laughs> you yeah. know? So if you want to ask, how do you go about doing that? Yeah. It's creating a compelling character, like the five W's, you know, who am I? You know, what do I like? What, when I wake up in the morning, what do I eat? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, where, where am I from? Where do I live? You know what I mean? Yeah. What, what, like, the, it's all the, theater, like learning theater as an actor. Like, you look at all these things. You know, what, what uh, inspires me? What, uh, why, why do I do, you know what I mean? Like, answering these questions as a character, like the other person, not you. Mm -hmm. I don't want to tell you, you, you know, you separate yourself from it. Yeah. You know, because when I talk about Moby Dick, Moby Dick is a wisecracking, no nonsense host with the most. And, you know, as Mo at a drag, I go, Mo, my name is Mo both ways. You know, so <laughs> I'm a deeply spiritual person. Yeah. I like doing service work, you know, and I like cooking in the kitchen. You know, like there's certain things like that. Yeah. They're like people. So it's like when you're creating a character, you're creating a different persona. Mm -hmm. It's not a party view. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I, I, I definitely do. This is one of the, the, one of the things that bothers me when people say, you know, masculinity isn't interesting or isn't a performance or whatever is, you know, so many kings are characters, right? A lot of the male impersonation actually wasn't just passing, right? It was about impersonating a character, right? The king, for example, Elvis, right? Good one to go to. But like, uh, 
I feel like that's where a lot of kings can draw something because there are male or masculine or, you know, whatever people in the world who are characters who are, you know, uh, able to be imitated. Like, I don't know. I feel like as I'm a theater person at heart. So I like the idea of coming, you know, coming in, coming in with a backstory with a moment before. Right. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's what makes so, and, and like my character, you know, so it emulates, you know, uh, like a blue collar worker cross between Polly Walnuts of the Sopranos <laughs> and I mean, Dangerfield. Yeah. You know, these, uh, you know, yeah. So you, and you can draw from that because even though those are masculine people, they are characters, right? And you know, I got to bring up though about toxic masculinity too, because, you know, some people say, oh, I don't want to do toxic masculinity and, you know, this. And, you know, okay, that's an aesthetic choice, yeah. you know, but it's not wrong. Right. It's not wrong. Because if I do toxic masculinity, what a, it's from a feminist perspective. Mm -hmm. So it's, I'm turning it on its ear. Yes. So I'm Exposing it in a comedic way. Right. And, you know, to make a point to be like, knock it off. <laughs> exactly. Right. It's not to emulate it, to perpetuate it. Right. Or because you're Thanks. perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And that's, and, but that's what also makes it fun and unthreatening. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I want to talk. Taking the sting at it, taking the piss out of it. Yeah. yeah and the Australians say take the piss out of it exactly you know, the sting out of it yeah. yeah so so I want to talk a little bit about kind of how you see um how where where's kinging going and I I we also discussed uh kinging as a verb uh before we started talking but where is where's the art of of being a drag king where is that going um or where do you what do you want to see from it what do, or what do you love about it what do you love about the world that's coming up now um, well, there's a lot of questions there. Um, <laughs> yeah. so what, what I love about what I'm seeing now, I love a lot. Uh, the artistry, it's incredible. You know, the makeup, I'm old school. Mm -hmm. I have, you know, realism look, yeah. right? And like, you've got the makeup on, you know, like the contouring, I am like blown away. And like the different colors, yeah. all that makeup. Oh my God. And the different characters. Amazing. Amazing. And, um, you know, so that blows me away uh, that the current Kings that really superseded the, uh, you know, the, the modern day, you know, the current Kings, you know, just surpassed the modern day, yeah. you know, because like I said, in my era, it's realism. We came out of the school of Diane tour, right. You know, so, um, in any case, uh, there's that. And, the level of performance, it's great. I'm like blown away, blown away. So where do I see it going? Yeah. You know, um, I hope there's going to be a, a international platform for it. I hope it will be uh, more mainstream. And I, I, I wince at the word mainstream because I came out of the punk era. Right. Like, oh, like, the, you know, the thought of mainstream is you're a sellout, you know, right. corporate sellout, you know, but, um, I, I hope that women not only get inspired to think, oh, I could be a drag queen, you know, that, you know, the hyper femininity, but they can, you know, explore the hyper masculinity and find that power and that form of expression where, you know, they are going, oh, look at this. I have this different kind of power that feels good, yeah. you know? that um, I could stand up to somebody, you know, I could speak my mind and nobody's going to say, eh, well, eh, eh, that idea, you know, you know, shut up, be quiet, you know, yeah. stay small, I'll speak, you know, all of that nonsense that women have had to fight and, and endure, yeah. you know, so, um, but having said that, so the future, I love this online, you know, shows, I mean, I'm blown away. Because there's the numbers by the, the, the connection yeah. and the numbers. Like that is unheard of. The fact that we could connect all over the world. Like the show in May 20th mm -hmm. that I've got South Africa, Denmark, Chile, um, let me think where else, uh, uh, Korea, Japan, 
I mean, come on. That's so cool. You know, and then the first show, it was Ireland and England and, you know, uh, multiple places in England, Mm -hmm. Ireland and France and Spain, you know, and Australia, New Zealand. I mean, that was in Israel, right? Like, it is real. like, come on. They were I, up at like 4 a.m., I think, right, to watch yeah. the show? Yes. <laughs> it was amazing, you know? But, the, and there, I mean, the, uh, the between the artistry and the performances, I was blown the fuck away. Yeah. That never could have happened before to connect kings from all over the world like this. Yeah. Could have never happened to this magnitude. Like, we were, you know, forced to you know do this because of the coronavirus the coronavirus is connecting us together in this beautiful powerful way yeah so that this is where i'm hoping that media will take attention you know and stand up and and, and recognize like we need a bigger platform you know something like rupaul drag race but yeah. i i don't know what that is i i mean let's just keep putting it out there and hope that that happens. Yeah. We'll get more Kings onto the Kings of the world Twitch stream and see what happens from there. Right. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Because, and then in June, the June show is pride. That's pride month. And so I've already started booking it. And so I want groups to, you know, it's only groups. So I right. want to say, you show me what pride is in South America. So all the drag King collectives in South America are teaming up. I've got, you know, South Africa. South Africa started in 2012. It was the first drag king community that started, to my knowledge, in, in Africa. It started in Cape Town. And, you know, so they, and it was uh, St. Jude, who now is in London, who started it. And uh, so Wolf Steel is the drag king who's leading that. They're going to perform us, do a solo in May, and then get the group together for June. And show us what's pride in, you know, uh, South Africa. And then, you know, we're going, so it's what's pride in all these different communities. So um, so excited. Oh. That's awesome. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And I'll definitely, I'll make sure there's links to the show. Cause I mean, I will be there. <laughs> so hopefully everybody it, else too. It, that's the thing. It's free. We're asking for a $10 donation. If you got it, you got it. If you don't, you don't, but just yeah. watch it. Yeah. Just sin. All I got to do is blink, blink and you know, just link. You know, connect to the link. That's it. Exactly. And the fact that we can learn from each other. So this is one of the things that I wish that uh, the Drag King community had and I think is going to have because of this. So when I'm when I perform burlesque, I perform in every festival that I can, even though I know they're expensive and there's not a lot of monetary or whatever benefit from it. I go to perform at festivals because I want to learn from people outside of my area. I wanna learn from new people. I wanna see the best of the best at the top of their game doing something different. And so, and every time I do a festival, a burlesque festival, I learn something new, right? Beautiful. Even though it may not, I'll never use it. But You're creating a too. Exactly, exactly. And you know, uh, f me and some of the people that I've met at festivals are now people that I'm, you know, like I will, I hope to always be connected to them, you know? And so I'm hoping that the drag kings get the same opportunity now because there's not a lot of drag king festivals, right? There's the drag king night at Austin International and, you know, there's that. <laughs> but like, this gives us the chance to learn from each other. So if you have the opportunity, fucking take it. Like I said, it takes the women and drag kings and trans and non-binary to come out and support the shows. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. one of the things I'm seeing with the drag queen shows, the gay men and straight women, you know, they're all over that shit. Yep. All, yep. They're support, They're coming out in the thousands supporting these shows. Where the fuck are the people supporting the drag king shows? Yeah. Don't mean, you know, log on, support the goddamn show. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Amen. And not, and not just kings of the world, all the shows. Oh, yeah. yeah. Again, I'm like, what's today? Let's let's see. Who's, and there's who's on? so many now. There's Twitch. There's Instagram. There's people doing it on Vimeo. Like, I'm doing three shows in next week. Like, let's just do it. Great. <laughs> yeah. So awesome. Uh, so as we're coming up on the end of the hour, um, is there anything that we didn't talk about that you're like we definitely need to discuss? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so. Yeah. I think we. Yeah. We covered a lot. Um, covered a lot, you know. So uh, one of the things that, you know, a lot of the kinks today, like I said, don't know 
um, who I am because I didn't have, you know, a lot of online presence. Yeah. And, you know, I'm in the Drag King book, which uh, is out of print. I have know. a copy. Oh. <laughs> awesome. Uh, yeah, I think you can find it on eBay. Oops. Sometimes it's hard to find it. But, um, but recognizing there were drag kings that came before you. Mm -hmm. That's really important to know that you're not alone. You're not isolated. There's a rich history that's behind you supporting you. Yeah. And you know? lear learning that history just makes you a better king because you can yeah. learn, like you can actually learn from the history, not just knowing the history, but what does that do for your performance? What does that do for the story you're telling? What does that do for the people you're trying to reach? Right? So yeah, absolutely. That's why I'm, it was excited to have you on specifically because like you want to go OG, like <laughs> here we go. Right. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so yeah. much. I, I mean, also like the other things that I did was, you know, and it, me as a person, like I said, I was like, okay, you know, when I started meeting drag Kings in New York city, yeah, I was like, wait, let's do a party, you know, yeah, so yeah. that's the world's first weekly drag king party. Then um, because of Mayor Gi Giuliani, I, I stopped the party because it was police harassment. It just sucked. That's a whole another issue. Yeah. So I said, all right, well, let's take the show on the road. Yep. So I did the first ever drag king tour of U.S. and Canada in 1998. And then we did it again in 2001 and then 2002. Yeah. So and as a result, you know, there were uh, multiple shows I was in. I'm in John Waters' film, Pecker. Yep. And, and um, you know, so there was like a lot that happened that I achieved a lot of firsts. Yeah. And I'm very proud of, you know. And, um, you know, I did work hard for it. You know what I mean? And, Absolutely. Um, because I saw, I, I saw the need. And, you know, like I said, rather than complain and be like, oh, Rudy Giuliani sucks. Yes, I protested. But I was like, fuck it. Let's take it, the show on the road. You know, and so now it's like, all right, drag kings are, you know, yo, we, the bars and clubs closed. All right, let's do an online show. Yeah. You know? So it's like, you got to keep going. You got to keep going. Stop complaining. Appreciate what's happening. And then co create community, create connection and stick with each other. Support each other. That's the biggest message I want to say today. Thank you so much, Mo. You're awesome. Thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Oh, all my pleasure. Thank you. Hey, I hope you enjoyed the show. And if you liked it, why not rate, review, and subscribe wherever you feel like rating, reviewing, and subscribing. If you want to learn more about today's guests, head over to facebook.com slash kingsvoicespod or check out the comments uh, or the description in the YouTube channel, uh, Kings Voices Pod. Uh, there I'll post all the links to everything you want to know about today's guest and you can find them from there. Uh, if you are interested in becoming a guest yourself, then why not shoot me an email at willxuldrag at gmail.com or shoot me a message on Facebook at facebook.com slash kingsvoicespod. All right, so that's it for today. And remember, keep your toxic masculinity to yourself, but share your drag with the world. <laughs>